And we are officially live with astronaut Abby, uh, who is currently at the Smithsonian Institute. Is that correct? Yep. I was here uh, touring around and checking out the museum and everything this morning. And they managed so. to get you into a back office so we can actually run this <laughs> interview, which is very exciting. Um, all right. So we're going to get straight to the bottom of it. You call yourself Astronaut Abby, but just to be clear, you haven't been to space yet. Yes, that's true. Not quite. I'm, I'm 18 years old. I just finished my first year of college, so I have yet to uh, actually go to space. Okay. So why do you call yourself Astronaut Abby? Uh, well, the first thing is that alliterations are really fun. So who doesn't love me? That, that start with the same letter. Yeah, so that's fantastic. But it's really, it's this idea that um, becoming an astronaut is, is what I want to do. It's something that I'm so excited about and so passionate about. And so Astronaut Abby was a name that when I was a lot younger, I was about 13 and I started setting up a blog and social media channels to share this journey that I'm on towards becoming an astronaut, that it seemed fitting to to title everything Astronaut Abby because that's what that's really what this entire journey is about is about reaching that goal. And obviously it works for you because you've been invited to to many prestigious events and you've hosted events and you've uh, interviewed some some interesting people. So the the idea of, of using astronauts certainly does help. But I want to go back a little bit. I mean you're 18 years old now. How did you get to wanting to be an astronaut, what was the turning point in your life that made you decide, that's what I want to do? That's a great question. For me, there, there wasn't necessarily a turning point. It's something that, as long as I can remember, I wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, some of my earliest memories are of being maybe five or six years old and going outside at night and looking up at the night sky and dreaming about what it would be like to travel in space, dreaming about going places that we've never gone before and about exploring. Um, and so as I, as I grew up, this was something that was always in my mind, this idea that I wanted to be an astronaut, I wanted to go to space. Um, and I also had a, a really strong science fiction influence. So my dad is a huge sci-fi geek, and so I grew up on a, a strong diet of reading all these books about space travel. Um, and up until about, probably I was eight or nine years old, I, I said that I wanted to be an astro-navigator, because that's something that I'd read in a science fiction book, and I thought that that was real. And so I realized eventually that that's not quite a real position yet, but that astronaut is. And so I settled for, for being an astronaut instead. Wow. So you're obviously a very supportive parents, uh, because if you're only 18, to go all those places and to get involved in all those things, uh, one or two parents must be coming along with you. Yeah, so my parents have been incredibly supportive of my dreams, especially my mom. Um, like I said earlier, I, I decided that I wanted to be an astronaut really young, and at first they had this, this kind of opinion where Outwardly, they were always very supportive, and they said, of course, you know, you can you can be anything you want, you can do anything that you put your mind to, that, that sort of uh, outward encouragement. But when I got older, they told me that inside my mom's mind, what she would say and what she would think is, this is crazy, there's no way that that's possible. You know, we live in Minnesota, this this isn't a career path that people choose where we live, this is, this is it's outlandish. Um, but she was outwardly very supportive. And so when I continued to be so excited about space over a long period of time and really started to put in the work and the effort towards it, she realized that this was a goal that not only was was possible, but was possible. And so after that, my, my mom definitely became my biggest supporter and has traveled with me around the world to different space agencies and things like that um, and really has just been incredible. Wow. Okay, but now let's let's go to the part where you you wanted to become an astronaut. You you obviously were quite keen, and you realized that from a young age that there are a lot of check marks one needs to make in order to to become an astronaut. So you thought, well, what I'm going to do is ensure that the path that I'm following has all those checkpoints in it, and that'll ensure that I have a better chance of becoming an astronaut. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that you'll become an astronaut. But 
but you're surely not going to sit there and say, well, well, if it's only a, an 80% chance, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to give it my all. You would do it even if there was a 10% chance. Absolutely, and the the percent chance is significantly lower than that. Actually, when you when you consider the number of people who applied in the last an, uh, astronaut class, I believe it was around eighteen thousand applicants, and they ended up choosing eight of them. So the idea of becoming an astronaut has this this incredibly low chance of it actually happening. But there are things that you can do to make it more likely. And so, like you said, I. Um, when I was about 11 years old, actually, I, I set out a plan of what I wanted the next 20 years of my life to look like, what kind of things I needed to achieve and accomplish, and what I needed to do in order in order to achieve and accomplish those things to build my resume and to build my chances of becoming an astronaut. So for me, it's things similar to getting my pilot's license, getting my scuba diving license, those types of things. Um, and then also learning different languages. So I spent four years studying Mandarin Chinese, and I'm now currently studying Russian. And actually, I'm doing a double major for my undergraduate in Russian and astrobiology. So it's it's all of these types of things uh, that start to add together and form this this lifelong resume that you have that eventually helps you to apply to the astronaut corps. Wow. But of course, not learning languages and I mean that's just some of the stuff you do on the side. You throw in scuba diving and gymnastics and a whole bunch of other things too. What are the other things that, that uh, are your interests? Yeah, so, oh no, are you still there? I'm still here, we can, yeah, you don't okay, worry. Something <laughs> that appeared on my screen that was not you. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there. Uh, aside from doing those things, I think that it's really important to have a balanced lifestyle. And so part of that for me means staying involved in a lot of things that um, that aren't necessarily related to my career goal, but are things that I enjoy right now. Because when you have a 20 or 30 year plan like this, where you're looking at a goal that is so far in the future, it's important to, to moderate it. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So you need to make sure you don't burn out. So. Some of the things that I, I do just for fun food, I play violin, um, I do I do a lot of art and things like that. Uh, I also am a varsity athlete for my college. I'm uh, part of the NCAA. I, I do springboard diving like that. I'm also a very um, very involved in dance in Boston. I do dancing and contra dancing and uh, waltz and all of those on a on a week. Sure. So you really are very involved. Now, this might sound a bit cryptic, but a friend of mine asked me to convey a message to you. He said he would love to be a part of the Hangout, but right now he is literally underwater in the BML. Would that make any sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. And who would that be? Very lucky to, to be there. <laughs> And, and who, who, who might that person be that would be sending a message like that? Would that by chance, would that be, huh, I wonder, who on, who, who on earth could that possibly be? Potentially Luca Permitano? It Am would not I... just be potentially be him, but it actually is him, of course. And, and he said he was really, really keen to be there, but unfortunately he was uh, going to be doing some training underwater in the, uh, is it, mu Neutral, so it's NBL, I think it's the NBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Neutral Lab. Buoyancy. Yeah. That's the ones. I've called it something completely different. But anyway, um, so how I does Luca factor in to your life? Where does, where does uh, the Italian astronaut Luca Parmitano, how does he fit into your life? Luca, Luca's incredible. He, um, Luca and I have a really interesting story that I'll tell when I was 13 years old. I went down to Florida to see a shuttle launch. And on the way back from it, um, I was going through the security in the airport, just general, normal TSA type security. And we're going through the security. And my mom and I turned around. And standing a couple people behind us, also going through security at the same time, was Luca Parmitano. And my mom points him out and says, Abby, I think that's astronaut Parmitano behind us. And I look around, and I'm like, Shh. Mom, of course that's not him. Like he's an astronaut. They don't travel in, in normal airports like the rest of us, do they? And she's like, No, that's definitely him. And so I I went up and I introduced myself and I asked uh, for an interview 
and he he was very kind and gave it to me and ended up actually sitting down and talking with me for about an hour and giving me all kinds of advice um, and telling stories and listening to me talk about what I was planning to do to become an astronaut, those types of things. And at the end, he gave me his email address and said, I will be your astronaut. If you have any more questions, email me. And so over time, Luca developed as a role model and as a mentor to me. Um, and two years later, he invited me to come watch his Soyuz launch to the International Space Station in Baikonur, Kazakhstan, and then work with him while he was on board the International Space Station as his Earth liaison to hopefully take this experience of seeing this incredible launch, which so few people get to see, as well as his time working in space and share it with this, this wide audience that I had on social media. Uh, so it's just, it's been really incredible to get to work with him and have him as a mentor for the past couple of years. How was it to see the launch? And, and is it any different to a shuttle launch? Oh, it's absolutely different. It was, it was phenomenal. It was one of the most incredible experiences of my, of my life. Um, it sounds so, I, I always try to not sound too poetic when I talk about this, but it's difficult not to because it was such a beautiful thing to see. The launch that we saw happened at about 2 a.m. in the morning, so it was completely dark, and we're standing in the middle of a desert, um, and one of the big differences from the shuttle launches is that you get to be very close when you're watching a Soyuz. So we were a, about a mile away from the launch, which is very close. The closest you can get to a shuttle is, I believe, uh, a little over three and a half miles. And so we're standing here in the middle of the night, and as soon as the rockets light up and as soon as the launch starts, it's so bright that it just it looks like it's, it's the sun because it's lighting up this entire desert plain, and so you can see everything as if it were daylight. And so to, to see that and also to know the people who were on board, it was a very emotional experience. Yes. Wow. Sure. And, and, I mean, through your interaction, obviously not only with Luca Palmitana, but you've obviously got to connect with other astronauts. Which, which other astronauts have you managed to connect with? Um, I've been lucky to meet uh, a fair handful of astronauts, but I think that the ones that I've really connected with and who, who have made a big impact are the three who are on board, who are on my uh, nonprofit board. So I recently, about nine months ago, started a nonprofit which is called the Mars Generation. See mm -hmm. it on here. You might have to stand okay. up a little bit higher. Stand up a little bit higher so we can actually see the logo. There we go. Yeah. Still. There we go. Uh, got it. Okay. And wonderfully enough, uh, three astronauts, Kent Rominger, Wendy Lawrence, and Dottie metcalf Lindenberger, agreed to be part of my advisory board. And so I've been getting to work with them for the past couple months, all of us working towards the same goal of inspiring students especially to take an interest and a passion for space exploration. Wow, but now you've got a logo that says the Mars generation. Why particularly Mars? What's so important about Mars? Mars is Mars has this symbolism for us. So Mars is an incredible goal for our generation to set our eyes on to say this is something that we want to do, this is something that we want to conquer, this is the next big step in space exploration and it's something that for a lot of people seems like it might be science fiction or it might be so far in the future but the reality of it is that if we really put our minds to it Mars is something that we can and will do within the next couple decades so we're talking 15 to 20 years from now we could potentially see people hopefully including myself walking on the Martian surface um, the reason that this is so important to my generation is because you can look you can look at every generation and you can say that they each had something that, that made that generation its own, some space exploration feat that was so unique. We had the Apollo generation, we had the shuttle era, people who grew up with space shuttles going off every, every couple months, you know, multiple times a year. And so for our generation, this is something that we need to see happen. We need to see humans continuing to expand our boundaries and to push farther than we've gone before by taking on a challenge like going to Mars. Well, one thing I, I did notice is that over the past couple of weeks, because we have the Humans to Mars Summit coming up very soon, in fact, it's starting tomorrow, if I'm not correct, and I know that you're going I'm to be speaking at the summit. 
That's correct. Um, one of the things that um, which is interesting is because I've been part of the technical committee, um, I've had the privilege of interviewing uh, a large number of the speakers from Charlie Bolden all the way to Sam Skimemi and then to, to Rick Davis and, and uh, uh, Jim Green. And what I find fascinating is that I always ask them, you know, why Mars, obviously, and, and, and you've obviously discussed that. But then the interesting part is that from a technological point of view, NASA has a goal to, to reach Mars by 2030. Mm -hmm. But Elon Musk comes along and he has a very different agenda. He wants to get there maybe in the next 10 years or 12 years, and who knows, that might change again in five years' time. From, from, a, I mean, from a, a, a game plan point of view, you've got your 20-year plan. Are you reevaluating as you start to see technology change? So it's, it's one of those things that is one of the unique parts of growing up in this generation that we have this um, this growing up and there are fields that we never would have imagined before and things changing so rapidly. Uh, it's difficult to predict what the future will be like, but for me personally, what I've chosen, what I've decided, is that I'm going to stick with NASA. I am placing my hopes with NASA. I hope to be a NASA astronaut and travel to Mars um, with a NASA mission. However, that doesn't at all exclude private industry or international cooperation or anything because with a goal as big as, as traveling to Mars, it's, it's going to be almost impossible to do it without having all of these different industries collaborate and work together. So it's, it's my personal belief that no matter what, what a particular company or agency is saying now, the end result will be a lot of collaboration and cooperation. Wow. Okay. Well, I can see that we've got quite a global audience. Uh, we've got a few people from India. We've got someone from Nepal. We've got someone from the Ivory Coast. We have a few in South Africa. We've got people who are viewing it live on YouTube as well. So it's, it's quite a global audience. And I know that the team at the Humans to Mars Summit, who are now setting up all the technical side, uh, they're busy watching it live as well. And, and of course, if Luca Palmitano had a screen under the water, He'd be watching it too. <laughs> um, so, so we we have a whole bunch of people that might want to ask you some questions. And uh, if any of the panelists that are here now want to ask questions, please just uh, type it in the chat, and uh, I'll call you up and, and give you a chance to to ask the question. So, so now you you're obviously running this NGO or this nonprofit or this foundation called the Mars Generation. There seems to be another astronaut who who might have. Uh, being one of the top three to land on the moon, uh, that also is running something about getting uh, a body part to Mars. He's obviously very keen to push for that. He has probably no chance of getting there himself. So we know that his motivation is obviously to promote STEM and, and that type of thing. But your goal is to be that person, to get your butt on Mars. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. This is true, but a part of it also is that, uh, so uh, I definitely want to be the first astronaut to Mars. This is a goal and a dream of mine that I have, but it goes larger than that. It goes into this idea that um, it's more about getting us to Mars. It's about getting humanity and us as a society to Mars. I've been asked this question before of, you know, what happens if it, if it isn't you? What happens if for some reason you cannot go to Mars or you cannot become an astronaut or if things just don't work out in your favor and it's you've put all this work in and it's not you and the answer is that I will still be incredibly pleased and happy and satisfied to know that I've gotten someone to Mars because in the end that's what it's about it's about getting us there as a society um, and all the all the work that my nonprofit is doing is it's not focused around me it's focused around my generation and the hope that someone will go there. So now tell me a bit more about your nonprofit and and some of the involvement of STEM activities that you're obviously promoting. I did recall a Facebook post about you involved in some robotics, maybe first Lego League or something to that effect. Tell me a bit more about some of the, the activities that you've been promoting from a STEM point of view. 
Yeah, so even before I started the nonprofit, I was documenting and sharing a lot of my experiences and the things I was involved with um, and running outreach around the world for STEM education and space exploration. And part of that was sharing these things that I was involved with. So in when I was a lot younger, I did first LEGO Robotics League. And then when I was a high school student, I mentored uh, girls teams in first robotics as well and had a variety of other programs that I was involved in, such as high altitude weather ballooning and things like that. Um, and so those are some of the things that I've been sharing and promoting. Just recently, I was at the TARP, which is Team America Rocket Tree Challenge, um, national challenge, speaking at the conference and helping to get the word out about that to more people so that hopefully more schools will be able to form teams. Because the idea is that you have all of these great programs like FIRST Robotics or like TARP things such as that. And there's such a great way to excite and engage kids and teenagers in STEM. Because hands-on learning is a really valuable tool, especially with younger people. Um, and so to, to really get the word out to students and teachers and parents about all the different opportunities that are out there is really important to me. Um, did part of that question include asking about what the nonprofit is doing, or did that you answer? You can tell me about your nonprofit. We want to hear everything. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so the Mars Generation is a nonprofit that has three major programs in it, and the first program is Space Camp Scholarships, which are full-paid scholarships that this year, despite being a brand new nonprofit, we are sending ten students to wow. space. Yeah, and so it's really it's really exciting. These are students who are living at or below the national poverty line. So they're not having these other types of um, opportunities that could inspire them to reach for STEM careers except for this. And so they get to provide that opportunity and hopefully see them continue to grow and become inspired in STEM is exciting. Uh, the second program is a Student Space Ambassador Outreach Program. So Student Space Ambassadors, the idea behind that is that it's a way to do two things. The first is to collect all of these students who are interested and excited about space exploration and STEM education and give them a community that they can be a part of, a community of like-minded young people who are doing the same things that they are. The second part to that is that it's also providing them with the, research, the resources uh, necessary so that they can go back to their communities and do outreach. There are a lot of different ways that you can do outreach, and it's it's unique and different for every community and for every student. And so we're trying to help them develop uh, how they how they can go to their own communities and bring STEM. The third program that we have is our outreach program, which is called the Future of Space, and that is basically taking all of the things that I was doing before I started the nonprofit and bringing them in. On, on a larger level. So it's things like writing blog posts and writing articles for different publications around the world, things like having social media channels that are working to educate and inspire the public, speaking at conferences, speaking in classrooms, um, just all those types of things and, and so much more. What do you enjoy most about speaking at schools for, especially the elementary kids? What, what do you enjoy most about that? My favorite part of speaking at schools, especially with the younger kids, is the question and answer section. I always try and keep my speech to a minimum. I try and do a short presentation with a lot of interesting you know, photographs and things like that because what the kids really want to learn about is what they're asking questions about. And when you, when you give them the chance to ask questions, you can watch them raise their hands and watch their eyes just light up with excitement over whatever it is that this particular student is interested in. Whether it's the possibility of extraterrestrial life or how water is recycled on the International Space Station, every student has something that excites them. And by letting them ask questions, you're getting directly to what they want to know. Now, you are a little bit of a fan of biology. Is that correct? So are you this looking to become an astrobiologist? Yes, I am. So I'm currently doing a double degree in Russian and astrobiology, and I'm hoping to continue to pursue astrobiology for my PhD work. And then eventually... Of Russian and, and astrobiology go very well together. I mean, they both cut a show. Um, so, so let's see. Um, <laughs> so, so, um, so, I mean, 
if you if you're looking at at uh, things like astrobiology, then two or three days ago, when was it? Last I think it was last week. I, I interviewed uh, Jim Green, and he said, "Oh, and I've got something now. I, I can't really say now." And I thought, "What is he holding back on?" The very next morning, they announced 1,280 planets have just been discovered. Well, obviously they've known about it, but they only announced it recently. How does that impact in terms of your excitement and passion for what you want to do? Because astrobiology is obviously going to be the big deal. When you get to that planet or when we get samples, it's about learning what was going on the surface and, and what can we learn about the actual planet itself. So it's quite a critical, uh, it's a specific field, but very critical for, for space, space exploration. Yeah, you're absolutely on the mark there. Those discoveries are so exciting to everyone in the space industry and planetary sciences, but especially to astrobiologists because, like you said, this greatly increases um, the, the things, our chances of finding biological life and our, our ability to look for it once we know about these. Um, I, I would like to push back and just, just mention something quickly about mm. astrobiology, though. Yeah. So, a lot of people, when you when you talk about astrobiology, they immediately jump to the idea of finding possible, you know, past, present, potential, future, uh, extraterrestrial life or biological life on other planets. But a really big part of astrobiology is not just looking for ET life; it's also looking at the life forms that we purposefully send into space and how space affects them, and how we can alter those effects and those types of things. So it's about it's about looking at um, everything from microbial life that we send to space all the way up to the full human and the way that, that a space environment affects life. How do your friends cope with you? You get to university and you are this big space geek. You love space. You, you eat, sleep, and drink space. You even wear uh, the, the jumpsuit. And do, I mean... Uh, do they make fun of you? Do they, or are they very um, supportive of you? H how do they take it? Oh my God, they make fun of me so much. It's fantastic. So I have, I'm, I'm really lucky because I, I ended up with a great group, uh, a handful of great groups of friends. One of them is the astronomy department at my school. Has, uh, is huge. It has a lot of astrophysics students and a lot of astronomy students. So I have a lot of friends there who are very into what I'm doing. And then I also have my friends who are not so into astronomy or not so into um, even science in general. I have a lot of, it's a liberal arts school and I take a lot of classes in other departments. So I have a lot of friends who are, you know, history majors or who are language majors or things like that. And they give me so much crap for this. Um, <laughs> it's fantastic. It's, it's all in, in good, good faith, though. Uh, for April Fool's Day, I had my roommate went and printed out pictures of me when I was like 14 giving a presentation in a classroom wearing my jumpsuit <laughs> and printed out probably a hundred of them and plastered them all over our dorm. And so everywhere I walked up and down the hallways and in our room was just pictures of these dorky pictures of me from It's marketing. Long. It's marketing. It's pure marketing. They, you can't complain. I mean, what is what is interesting is that when people know you as astronaut Abby then they also treat you like astronaut Abby and and that can be positive so for example when something spacey happens they come and tell you if there's a, a space opportunity they get you involved and you, that's purely because of your profile so mm -hmm. it can have its, its its positive spin oh absolutely it's and that's that's a big part of what I tell students is that no matter how big or how outlandish your dream seems, you have to be very vocal about it because it might seem crazy or daunting to some people or embarrassing in some aspect to go around and to wear the flight suit or to call yourself astronaut Abby or do something like that or even make claims like I want to be an astronaut or I'm going to be an astronaut. That's a scary thing for a young person to say. But the thing is, is that if you're not willing to do those things, if you're not willing to be the biggest advocate for your dream and to be vocal about it, then nobody else knows how they can help you. And nobody else knows what you're doing or how they can get involved. And so by, by being willing to, to push away that, that worry that we have and that anxiety that we have about you know dreaming too big or anything like that, 
you know, you open yourself up to a lot of opportunities, and that's definitely been the key for me. Well, I think also the never give up attitude. Uh, Charlie Bolden was very quick to say that when when someone puts a limit on you, just ignore them because if you know what it is that you want to do, you just go ahead and do it. Don't don't listen to other people because if they dampen your spirit, you might actually believe them and believe in the limitations they put on you when that's not necessarily your own limitation. Absolutely. So now I'm, I'm going to check to see if there are any questions. Um, at the Ivory Coast, Kim, do any of your students have any questions? I see a couple of hands. So we'll unmute you. Here we go. Say your name. Okay. And your grade. My name is Sochi. Can you hear him? My name Can is Sochi. Yep, we can hear him. Go ahead. Is there a planet that has land and water and there other than the Earth? Yes, that's a, absolutely, that's a really good question. Thank you. So, uh, if I heard that correctly, the, planet, the question was, is there a planet that has land and water and air other than the Earth? So, the answer to that is that, as far as we know, there aren't any planets that are just like the Earth. But there are planets out there, especially close to home, that have similar similar characteristics in a lot of ways to the Earth. So, especially over the past couple of years, we've seen evidence on Mars of possible liquid flowing water on the surface. So we've seen a lot of um, salt deposits and things like that that point us to the idea that there might be water there. Uh, you have planets that have massive atmospheres like Venus that are so much larger than the Earth's all the way down to very small atmospheres like Mars. Um, so yeah, there are there are plenty of planets even this close within our solar system that that have characteristics that are similar to Mars or similar to Earth. <coughs> wow, so that is very interesting. And and do you reckon that in your lifetime we're going to well I do think we're gonna find life on another planet, but it's not going to be the life that, that people are expecting. It's going to be, when we spoke to, to Penny Boston, who, who will also be speaking at the H2M, uh, the Humans to Mars Summit, she was saying that, you know, they go digging in caves in very inhospitable environments and, and you know, where it's pouring with acid and, and has uh, dangerous fumes and, and you would never, ever expect to find life in an environment like that, yet they are able to identify life forms. So I do think that if we get to the water on Mars, we will find something. But we first got to get there. That's the hard part. Absolutely. That's it's definitely important that we get there and, and it's it's really about it's about looking for water and it's about looking at carbon cycles as well. Because we can look at the way that carbon is cycled through the different the different reservoirs on a planet like Mars, which are the lithosphere, the atmosphere, and the hydrosphere. So the lithosphere refers to the crust and the mantle. The atmosphere obviously refers to, you know, we know what an atmosphere is. It's all the gas, the gaseous envelopes surrounding the planet. And then you have the hydrosphere, which is water um, and anything that was, you know, created with water, so sedimentary rocks and things like that. Um, and then superimposed over all of those uh, carbon reservoirs, you have the biosphere, which is interacting and changing all of those reservoirs. And so that's something that you know we really need to keep our eyes out for, is not just the presence of water, but how these carbon reservoirs are changing, and if those changes could potentially be due to a biosphere that, that that'll help lead us to. Um, but we've, we've almost reached the limit I wouldn't say we've reached the limit, but it's a lot more difficult to search for both water and to search for those carbon reservoirs with robotics and with orbiting satellites and things like that. So we're getting to a point where if we want to start making these really big discoveries, we need to send a human to Mars and we need to send uh, a human to do that type of exploration. Okay. I mean, is there anyone in Ivory Coast who's planning to be an astronaut and, and is willing to go and find uh, the water on Mars and actually bring back some samples. Any takers? <laughs> any any future Martians out there? Yeah, we've got a couple. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Kim, does anyone in your group have a question? Yeah, we yes. do have a few questions. Fire away, fire away. Oh, there you are. Go ahead. Step up in front. Say your name and what grade you're in. My name's Chimble. And I'm in fourth grade. 
My question is, are you going to space alone or you're going with someone? That's a great question, Chumble. Um, so we would definitely send people to space with other people. So right now we send astronauts up in groups of three, and that's because the Soyuz, which is the rocket that we use, we partner with the Russian Space Agency to send astronauts and cosmonauts uh, to space, has three seats on it. And so we usually send people up there in groups of three. The International Space Station, however, which is where we send astronauts, can hold nine people total. We usually don't keep a full nine people because it gets pretty crowded up there with nine people. So usually they have about six astronauts in space at a time. For a mission like going to Mars, you could potentially have anywhere from three to six astronauts on that mission. And part of that is that on such a, a complicated mission and, and something that takes so long, um, you need a lot of different specialties. You need people who are who are really good at a lot of different fields. So you might want to have a physicist with you and a biologist and a geologist um, and all these different fields. So you definitely want to take want to take some friends with you. It's a great question. Very good. Thank question. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We have a lot of questions. If it's okay, they've actually you got can a ask away. And and of course, if if Sebastian in India or his colleagues in India would like to ask, or if Govinda's uh, family would like to ask a question uh, in Nepal, you're welcome. Just to type it in the text, and, and I'll uh, open up. I'll unmute you, and you can ask the question yourself. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, say your name. And my name is Chiti, and I'm in second grade. When are you going? Yeah? When when are you going? That that is a good question. When are you going to outer space? Thank you, Chiki. That's a fantastic question. So right now for me the earliest that I would go to space would probably be about ten years from now. Because I just finished my first year in college, which means I have three years of that left. I have three more years in my undergrad. And then I have maybe four years in a PhD program, four or five. And then you have to work for a couple years in the industry. You have to get experience working with NASA, working in whatever field that you get your degree in. So I'll be working as an astrobiologist. Um, and then after that, I would apply to the astronaut corps and hopefully go to space. So for me, the earliest would probably be 10 years from now. When will we go to Mars? We're hoping to go to Mars in the 2030s, so about 15 to 20 years from now. Are you going to join me? Are you going to go? I think, I think she wants to join you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. All right. Anyone else got another question? Who else yes. question? What's your question? Yep, we still have more. You can keep asking. Okay, my great. name Thank is you. Margaret, and I'm in second grade. And my question is, which planet, are, which planet are you going to, and what's your favorite? Oh, that is a good question. Well, let's see. That is a good question. The the planet that I want to go to, and the planet that NASA is currently proposing to go to, is Mars. Um, as far as what's my favorite planet, I think that Earth is my favorite planet. <laughs> Good That's choice. because we have a lot of fantastic people here on Earth, and we have a lot of fun things like water um, and an atmosphere. <laughs> I'm a really big fan of breathing, so I like to be on Earth. But as far as my favorite planet to to explore, Mars would be my favorite to explore. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, have before the next person asks, uh, we have Sebastian in India who wants to know when when are you going to next be visiting India? <laughs> um, well, invite me. I uh, I don't currently have any plans to come visit India, but if there were something like uh, a conference, like the Humans to Mars Summit, that wanted me to come and speak there or um, speak in schools or something like that, I, I would absolutely love to to get to help spread the Mars generation. Uh, do, you, do you attend uh, events like the IAC? I haven't, but uh, 
nothing is nothing is closed for the future. So. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I mean, once you're into all these sorts of things, and obviously you start looking at events that are going to further your your career and your networking, because it's not what you know to you know. I mean, if if you have five candidates and all of them have studied the identical thing, but the selection committee all know you, it does help a little bit along the way. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then of course, the big question is when are you coming to South Africa? <laughs> and it's the same answer, is that I would love to visit and I would love to get to speak in person in South Africa and meet all of the excited young people there. Um, but I, I would need to, to have a, an invitation or a, a purpose. Okay. Well, just, just know that I know a few people in the space industry that might be looking at starting something exciting in Cape Town. And, uh, of course, there could be some opportunities, but we'll chat about that off air. Um, yes. Let's go back to the Ivory Coast and let's see if there are any more questions. Hi, my name is Chibango. And my question is, are you going to every planet in space or just one? Wow. <laughs> That's a big question, yeah. Um, first off, what grade are you in, Chibango? Oh, four. Grade Fourth four. Grade. Oh, that's so much fun. Um, okay, so yeah, great question. The answer is that right now we're only looking at going to Mars. NASA is is only is we're choosing one one planet and one goal, and we're going to go there. Um, the the reason for that is because there it's it's really difficult to go to a lot of planets. So going to Mars is very difficult. But let's say going to Jupiter or Saturn is even more difficult because they're so much farther away. And then you come down to the fact also that a lot of these planets we wouldn't even be able to land humans on with the current technology that we have because it's a gaseous planet or it's a planet like Venus that has such a heavy atmosphere that you've just crushed. Or it's a planet like Mercury that's too hot for us to land on. So right now, going to Mars is really our one of our best options. And how long does it take to get to Mars? Um, estimates range, and it depends on when you go, but it can be anywhere from, I've heard the lowest is usually about six months, and the highest can be up to a year and a half. To and get that's there. a long time to travel. Yeah, considering that it's a two-way trip, it's, it's quite, a, quite a long time. I mean, the complexity would be that if it takes you, let's say, seven months to get there, you have already now spent seven months getting there, which means that Mars is now moving further away from Earth. So by the time you want to travel back, it's not going to take you seven months to get back. Exactly, which is why it's important that you time really well to not only make it the shortest distance there, but the shortest distance, you know, round trip. And that's where you start to get into the, the, the idea also of, you know, if we go to Mars, do we do we just do what we did on the moon and stay for a couple days or stay, like, do a quick touchdown and then leave? Or do we go and do we stay for three months or six months or a full year? Because once you've put in, A, once you've put in that much effort and time to get somewhere, shouldn't you stay for a little bit longer? And B, potentially that'll make the return trip easier if, you know, we have to wait for, for things to line up better to shorten that distance again. So it's really a question of, of when and what type of decisions are made, which we won't know until a lot farther into the mission planning. Okay. And and Govinda, do you have a, a question you want to ask out in Nepal? You can unmute yourself. There we go. Hello. Hello. I'm Sochalika from Nepal. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely, please do. Oh, when you go to space, normally how long is it for? And how do you maintain your habits like eating and cleaning? Good that question. Is, yeah, thank you for asking that. So right now, we usually send astronauts to space for about six months. That's they get to go and they stay on the International Space Station for about six months. We have had astronauts who have stayed um, in fact, one recently who has stayed for uh, a full year. Um, recently, there was one, and well, there were two. The, the Russian, 
It was Scott oh, and, and Miguel, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, was, I was thinking in the past there was another Russian who stayed um, for a long time, but you're right, when we did the year-long mission, we had a, an, an American astronaut and a Russian cosmonaut who stayed for a full year, um, or nearly a year. And when you're looking at that, anywhere from even three months or six months is a really long time to be in space, but a year is even longer, and so to maintain their habit, they have to change the way that they do a lot of things. Um, they have to change the way that they shower and the way that they eat and the way that they exercise. Um, but it's it's not much different from how we've been doing things for, for a, the, a lot of the time that we've been in space. So they, they have this down to a science for a lot of things. So for example, in space, you don't need to shower nearly as often as you do on Earth. Because on Earth, you're constantly fighting against gravity, and that takes a lot of work, so you get sweaty and you get warm. And you're also interacting in a, in a really dirty environment, and you have the potential to go out and garden and do things like that and play sports, which makes you need to shower more frequently. But when you're in space, you're not necessarily interacting with anything that could make you dirty, so they might not need to shower or clean themselves for a week, possibly longer. And um, it's not no different to, to many of the elementary kids that we've, we've encountered. They have the space <laughs> philosophy. Uh, that's built in. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, well, obviously and, doing something right there. and of course, the biggest problem would be that if you were on a space station for for long enough, and the toilet uh, packs in, that's not a, a good situation. Yeah. So luckily, on the International Space Station, they have two toilets: one in the in the American sector and one in the Russian sector. So there's there's always a backup for um, for that situation, but if you're on a, let's say, a mission to Mars, or even a shorter mission to the moon or something like that, and your toilet malfunctions, that can be a little bit of an issue. Yeah, you'd have to, you'd have, to have a mechanic or someone who's familiar with how to fix that to help make sure that doesn't happen. Well, I mean, you were saying that you need a multi multidisciplinary team. So you've got to have someone with mechanical or engineering experience. You've also got to have a medical doctor with you because if someone's appendix bursts or, or someone decides to have a tooth abscess, uh, it could be, well, I suppose tooth abscess, you could uh, just take antibiotics. But, but I mean, at the end of the day, if your tooth is about to burst and they have to extract it, you need someone with medical experience that could actually assist you. And not only do you need someone with medical experience, they need to have the knowledge to be able to take those actions because if you're, let's say you're orbiting around the Earth on the International Space Station and something happens, someone gets cut or like you said, their appendix bursts or something like that, you could potentially call down to Earth, you could call down to Mission Control and say, you know, we need a doctor on Earth to advise us how to take care of this situation. When you're traveling to Mars, you have this time delay between when you send out a message and when Earth receives it and when they send it back. So we're talking more than 20 minutes here for every communication. That's a long time for an emergency, so you need to have a doctor on board who would be able to take care of these types of issues without having to consult someone else. Um, Is that another major that you're planning to maybe fit in between mm -hmm. the Russian? Just, just I mean, for fun, uh, when you go diving. <laughs> I really want me to do a triple major, so. <laughs> when you go diving, uh, how deep do you go? Um, up to this point, I think that I have done up to, what is it, 110 feet would be so you do the, 30 meters. yeah, so, yep, um, 30 or 40 meters. Uh, and, and your ears kind of okay? Yeah, I've, I've been okay so far with, with the equalizing and everything. Um, I'm actually looking at potentially doing a deep diving certification this summer so that I can dive lake by call, which... <laughs> the oldest lake in the world, um, and I'll be visiting doing some biological research there at the end of the summer. So we'll see that answer might change. Well, you know that we do have uh, certain great dive sites in South Africa, uh, and at one or two of them, you can actually get to witness the coelacanth, which is, do you know what the coelacanth is? No, I was just going to ask, what is the that? The coelacanth is a prehistoric fish that was recently discovered a, a couple of years ago. It was discovered by accident. They caught it in a net. And, it, and if you look at the fossils of the fish, they haven't changed since those days. 
and they uh -huh. are still swimming around in, in, in groups of about, I think, a hundred or so, and they are literally living prehistoric fish, which wow. is quite incredible. So the kind of, and you could come and swim with great white sharks too. You keep making the case to come visit more and more appealing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, do you have any siblings? I do. I have an older sister who's two years older than me, and I have a younger half-sister who is um, nine. How do they cope with all this space stuff? Are they interested? Are they are they cheering you on like cheerleaders, or are they just like, oh, the space cadet, they just carry on and do her own thing? How do they respond to all of this? My older sister is a lot like some of my friends at college, where she likes to just take the mickey out of me and make merciless fun in instances. Um, but when it comes down to it, she is always very proud and very supportive of what I do. So she has told me in the past that, you know, she she's proud of what I'm doing, which is great. Um, but she's she's not super interested in STEM or in science or space herself. Uh, my younger sister, on the other hand, um, she's she's nine, so she's still not quite sure what she is interested in. But she loves what I do. I came and I spoke at her school, and it was it was really fun. Um, I asked her once, though, I asked her, do you want to come to space with me? And she looked at me and was just like, no, absolutely not. <laughs> I'll leave that one to you. And I was like, okay, that's that's fine. That, not everyone has to want to be an astronaut. So, <laughs> Very cool, yeah. very cool. So let's see, do, do we have any other more questions from, from Ivory Coast, Kim? Oh, yes, they're very excited. You want to just unmute? Yep, about four, four questions. Okay. My name is Elizabeth. I'm in fourth grade. Are you excited to go to space? Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so, like I said, it's still going to be a while before I go to space. I'm looking at at least 10 years before I could go to space. But that said, I'm still so excited because the idea of going to space is incredible. It's super exciting to explore and to think about being in space and even just to think about, you know, floating. So I'm, I'm very excited to go to space. But now you might get a chance in the next five years before you even embark on, on, on a real trip to space, you might get a chance to go suborbital or, or something like that through a commercial project. Yeah, I was actually just talking to someone this morning who was asking me, so have you ever done a suborbital flight? And I was, you know, I, I said, no, I have yet to do that. And they, they looked at me and said, oh, man, I did one for an educational program a while ago. You have to do it. It's supposed to be so much fun. So uh, for any of the students out there who might not know what a suborbital flight is, the idea behind a suborbital flight is it's an airplane that you take and you make these big parabolic arches like this. And for about 30 seconds of time at the very top of the arch, you get weightlessness. You, you get this feeling of weightlessness that's very similar to being in microgravity. So everything around you floats, and it feels like you're in space. So they use that as a simulation to show astronauts what it's going to be like and help train them for the conditions of, of living and working in space. Wow. But I, but I can imagine you would still be excited, even with... I mean, if you knew that you were going to get a big surprise for your birthday in 10 years' time, you would still be excited, but, I mean, as you're getting closer, maybe the excitement might start building because this is the biggest birthday present you could ever imagine. So I, I think that Abby would be very excited to go to space. Would you oh, be excited uh, to go to space? Elizabeth, would you be excited to go to space? Uh, I'm not sure. You're not sure? <laughs> That's a perfectly good answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yep. We got next up Varushka. Go ahead, Varushka. I'm Varushka. I'm Varushka. I'm in second grade. Is it hard to sleep in space or not? Hi, Varushka. That's a great question, and it's really fun to answer. So I don't necessarily think that it's more difficult to sleep in space. Um, but there are a couple things that you have to make an adjustment for. And the first thing is you have to say, you know, where are we going to sleep? And the way that they solved that on the International Space Station is they made these great sleeping bags for the astronauts 
that the astronauts will get in their sleeping bag and they can strap it to pretty much anywhere that they want. So they can strap it to a wall or the floor or you can even sleep on the ceiling if you want. As long as there's nothing else already there, you can go and attach your sleeping bag. Because when you're in space and everything's floating, there's not really any up or down. So if you put yourself on the ceiling, it becomes the floor, which is really cool. Um, the thing about these sleeping bags, though, is that when you're, when you're in one, if you don't put your arms inside of it, your arms will just float like this. And so astronauts who are asleep sometimes just look like mummies with their arms floating in front of them. So a lot of times they'll strap their arms in so that they don't scare their, their co-astronauts. Um, the other thing that you have to be careful about sleeping in space is that every 90 minutes on the International Space Station, you orbit the Earth, and so you see a couple sunrises. And that can be really difficult when every 45 minutes you're seeing a sunrise or a sunset because you're trying to sleep, and suddenly there's all this light flowing into your room. There's all this light flowing into where you're sleeping, and it wakes you up. So a lot of times astronauts will wear eye masks while they sleep so that they can block out this continual change of light. Wow. So, but, but are they not worried about maybe if astronauts are sleeping and you often watch that they, they, they obviously either strap their arms up or they put their arms into something, but if their hands are loose, can you imagine you wake up to someone's hand fiddling with your nose or in your ear or maybe pushing buttons they shouldn't be pushing? I mean, it could be potentially dangerous. That's, that's an especially a worry that I have about sleeping in space is that it, I like to sleepwalk sometimes. And so I could cause a lot of havoc on a space station <laughs> and spacecraft if I got out of my sleeping bag and started sleepwalking around and, you know, just pushing buttons and suddenly, you know, you're on your way to Mars and you didn't mean to be. Or I mean, let's be honest. I mean, sleep spacewalking hasn't really been done before. So you could be <laughs> setting a precedent. I like that. <laughs> okay, Varushka, thank you so much for that question. Are there any other questions? Yes, We're going to take two, two more questions. Two more questions. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Bradley. I'm in sixth, fifth grade. Um, my question was, um, why did you go to Mars and not like Mercury or Venus? Why Mars? That's a great question. So the reason that we want to go to Mars, there are a couple reasons. First off, it's, it's one of the planets that is more accessible to us. So it's close enough to us that it's not impossible for us to get to right now. We have, we have the ability to, to get there and back, um, or we have the ability to create the technology to get there and back, versus planets that are farther out might be more difficult to get to. Um, but as far as those close-in planets go, Mars is also a lot easier for humans to land and survive on than, say, Venus or Mercury, because Mercury is really hot. It's really close to the sun, and it experiences a lot of extreme temperatures. And Venus is also really hot because of what's called a runaway greenhouse effect, which is where all these greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere of Mercury or of Venus are um, basically reflecting the sunlight back into Venus and, and causing it to continue to build its heat. Um, it also has such a thick atmosphere that the pressure on Venus is really extreme, so it just makes a planet like Venus really difficult to land on. The second reason that we want to go to Mars is because Mars has a lot of really interesting things that we can learn from it. We can, can learn about the history of our solar system, we can learn about what happened to Mars's atmosphere, those types of things. And we can also look for signs of biological life. Because the fact that Mars has this potential for liquid water means that it also has the potential for biological life. So it's really it's a great place to go for both of those reasons, that it's accessible and it's got a lot to offer us scientifically. Good question, Brady. Good question. All right, we've got time for one more question. And then we're going to round off. So let's see go, who's up. So she let somebody else different go, okay? Thank okay. you. <laughs> Here we go. My name is Anaya, and I'm in seventh grade. I Good wanted up. to ask. Anaya. I wanted to ask. Um, what are you going to do while you're waiting for to reach on Mars? Mars. That's such a good question, Anaya. So, 
earlier, it's a really long ways to Mars. It could be anywhere from six months to a year or a year and a half to get to Mars, and that's a really long time. So on the way there, you definitely need to do something to keep yourself occupied. And part of that is that uh, the astronauts who are on their way to Mars will have a lot of tasks associated with maintaining a spacecraft. So you have to do you have to do some maintenance, you have to do cleaning, those types of things to make sure that your spacecraft is working as it should be. And then you also will probably have some scientific research that you're doing along the way. So experiments that you're conducting, maybe things that you're setting up or getting ready for when you land on Mars. And then you'll also have uh, leisure activities that the astronauts will bring with them to occupy their time. So you know things like reading books or listening to music or corresponding with their family back on Earth, all of those things are, are potentials for, for things that astronauts could do on the way to Mars. Wow. Sure. So, you, I mean, but you'll be busy for the next 10 years taking on as much as you can because at the end of the day, it's, it's really what you want to do. So what advice would you give people who are keen to follow in your footsteps? A lot of young people... They, they have dreams, and, and sometimes people will squash their teachers might say, listen, I don't think uh, this is really for you. You're much better at dancing. Rather become a famous dancer. What, are you, what advice would you give young people to, to follow your dreams but, but actually follow their own dreams? Yeah. So the advice that I would give young people about following a dream, whether it's in space or in STEM or in something completely different, this holds for all fields, is that you need to be very confident about it. You need to believe in yourself, and you need to be your biggest advocate. So you need to get rid of all those doubts that you might have about whether or not this is possible, whether it's possible for you. Um, and you need to not be embarrassed about having a dream that maybe seems too big or too unrealistic. Because if you're embarrassed about it, and if you don't believe in your own dream, how, is, how are anyone else supposed to believe in it for you? Um, you need to be your first and your strongest advocate and be really vocal about your dreams so that other people can also believe in you and what you're doing. Well, I think that is amazing advice and, and definitely something that uh, the students should take to heart. We're just going to ask Abby to do one small thing. Hopefully the, uh, the clarity will, will improve a little bit. We're going to try and get you to smile at the camera and we'll take some screenshots. And then, uh, if, if that works, uh, we will then, let's just have a look. Is it getting better? I think so. Okay, you can just keep smiling and we'll take a photo. There we go. And one more. There we go. Got it. And I'm going to stop the broadcast over here. Thank you very much for all of you who joined us live on YouTube on the Living Maths website. And for those of you that are going to be watching uh, this will probably be streamed live at the Humans to Mars Summit on their website. You want to say something? Sure, Abby. Could I make one more quick comment? I had someone who wanted sure. to meet all of the students and the other people who are watching, and that is Mousonaut, who is oh, busy. Oh, tell us about um, Mousonaut. And so Mousonaut runs a Twitter account, and so you can find him on Twitter, and he goes on little rocketry um, adventures. And Mousonaut is really interesting and fun, and so I'd recommend that everyone go check him out. And so he's visiting for the Humans to Mars Summit as well. From Germany. From, from Germany, yeah. Awesome, awesome, so. awesome. So now, is your mom in the background hiding away? <laughs> yes. Hello, hey, mom. mom. How are you? <laughs> We've got to get a photo of mom, too. <laughs> Every college student is a nightmare, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just, you know, you, you're trying to picture, uh, is your mom too involved? Not at all. There's your mom holding up the cue cards, and she's pointing, saying, say this, say this. And <laughs> 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 we know you're supporting mom. Don't worry. We're not, we're not, <laughs> we're not going to give you a tough time. <laughs> I'll give her more of a tough time. I always do, that's for sure. <laughs> But I do think that what is important is that behind every successful person is, is obviously a, a very um, cohesive um, support group. And, and obviously having your mom being so supportive of you means you can go out and visit all these wonderful places. I mean, you have got a busy schedule. How are you managing that 
and your, your university studies? <laughs> Um, well, it's like you said, it's, it's really, part of it is having such a great support system and such a great team, and that's part of why I founded the Mars Generation, was to be able to create more of that network of support so that I didn't have to be responsible for the outreach program and for, for all of those pieces um, alone. So my mom is incredible. She is um, such a big part of the Mars Generation, and so is the rest of both our board and our advisory board. Uh, and we also have a lot, uh, a handful of volunteers who are doing incredible work, um, helping us with all the work that we do. And so that's that's really been the the biggest part about it is to, you know, both try and balance, you know, finding balance in your life and also making sure that you have a good support network. So. Well, I think it's fantastic <laughs> you know, that you have the support network, and we are very grateful that you have given up an hour of your time. To, to share your passion for, for not only STEM, but space and Mars and the Mars generation. And obviously, with the YouTube link, we'll put all the links to all the other things in your, your uh, NGO. We'll make sure we, we list that as well, because it's very important that uh, people who are promoting STEM get promoted as well, because that also helps us to, to share the message. And, and from what I can understand, the Humans to Mars Summit will be streaming this talk live on their live stream as well. And they will have a video channel, and they're going to be playing some of the interviews that I've done over the last couple of weeks. We are holding holding thumbs that we will get a message that maybe Bill Nye is going to give us an interview. And uh, sadly, Buzz is too busy to give us an interview for now, but hopefully he'll be giving us one soon. And we've heard there's a good chance he might be coming down to South Africa. So we're quite excited about that as well. Wow. But on that note, <laughs> we're going to have to bid you farewell. Thank you to everyone else that joined us. I'm going to stop the broadcast here.